Uh, Senator Whitmore, Representative Hickman, and members of the Citizens Trade Policy Commission. My name is Julie Ann Smith. I am the Executive Secretary of Maine Farm Bureau, which is the state's largest nonprofit grassroots farm organization. Our membership is comprised of every type of agricultural commodity and production philosophy. We have represented the voice of all agriculture in Maine for the past 66 years, and I am very grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you today about China um, chicken being imported from China. Maine agriculture is a bright star for our state. Farming in Maine has grown, and Maine continues to lead the New England states with 8,200 farms and over 1.4 million acres of farmland. Maine's agricultural enterprises provide more than $764 million throughout the sale of farm products and contribute more than $2 billion annually to the state's economy. Maine's agricultural products are increasingly available at locally in farmers markets, schools, and institutions. Maine was once a leading producer of poultry for the United States. Today, however, there are very few poultry producers in Maine. That is one of the reasons that there is only one farmer here today to assist me in my presentation. Um, there were, I reached out to many, many people listed as poultry farmers, and what I found was that most of them no longer produced poultry or didn't feel that they had anything they could really contribute um, to this conversation. Um, the majority of poultry producers operate on a very small scale and primarily sell at farmers markets. The success of the few poultry producers in Maine is due in part to a national movement to know your farmer. There is a growing interest in Maine by consumers to purchase locally produced food either directly from farmers or in retail markets. The Maine poultry market has a large potential for growth. But the importation of chicken from China raises many questions about the feasibility of market expansion in Maine. Maine Farm Bureau members have raised two primary concerns regarding chicken imported to the United States from China, and those are food safety and market impact. Um, currently, most produ poultry producers operate under the Maine Meat and Poultry Inspection Program, which allows them to sell poultry within the state of Maine, um, that it, they are confined to the state, they cannot sell across state lines. The Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry inspects farms and provides periodic reviews and education. This helps to minimize the food safety risks present in the stages of production, processing, distribution, and consumption. Under the current agreement with China, cooked poultry processed in China will be allowed to be exported to the United States without country of origin labeling. So chickens will be raised in the United States or equivalent countries and slaughtered in the country where they were grown they will be then shipped to China and to be turned into processed products and then uh, shipped back to the United States to be sold. The Chinese processing facilities are responsible for verifying that the cooked products exported to the United States came from American or Canadian burns, so no USDA inspector will be present in the plants in China. Uh, producers in China are only encouraged rather than required by the Chinese government to adopt global compliance standards in their manufacturing process. The U.S. system puts the responsibility of checking for problems mostly on the manufacturer. Currently, there are only two FDA food inspectors in China that oversee the 500,000 food production and processing companies in China. At this time, there are not adequate resources to ensure that chicken exported from China meets U.S. requirements. We are further concerned about what this is going to do to consumer expectations. Because of the reduced cost of production available in China, the market will allow for chicken to be sold at a rate below the cost of production for Maine poultry producers. This scenario causes great harm to local farmers as it creates an unrealistic ex expectation by consumers that poultry can be produced inexpensively. In the long term, this will inhibit the growth of Maine poultry producers if they cannot sell their product for more than the cost of their production. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important issue, and I am happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you for that report. <clears throat> uh, I'll start out with a few questions. Um, do I understand correctly that uh, live birds are raised here and in other countries and shipped to China? Yes. Alive? They are not shipped alive. Okay, so they're slaughtered here. Yes. Shipped, uh, put on ice, we would assume. I would Shipped hope. to China. Yes. <laughs> and then they're processed there yes. and they come back here. But through that process, um, there's a couple of inspectors 
um, that are seeing how the processing goes over there, but are the birds actually, or is the processed product actually inspected as it's packaged, or is there any type of inspection um, indication on that packaging as the consumers receive it here in the United States? So, I... Did I, did, did I uh, make that a long <laughs> question? Or? I, I want to answer carefully because I am not want, I, 100 percent sure on that and it probably is a question that's better asked of someone from the state or usda okay. but i will do my best to answer it as far as i understand because these birds are grown in the united states um, once they are shipped over to china for processing there really isn't a whole lot of inspection that goes on basically we ask permission of the Chinese government to go into the inspection plants in China. Um, once we're granted that permission, we can then mm -hmm. go to the plant. Um, and then that, but we don't have someone stationed there regularly. So in terms of whether USDA or FDA is inspecting everything regularly, Probably My research not. would indicate no. Are there any Chinese inspectors that are uh, keeping an eye on the, the processing of the poultry that you acquire of? From what I read, um, no. I, I mean, it, it's extremely minimal. They do not have a large investment in overseeing food safety. For the most part, you have a lot of um, companies like Walmart who do their own food safety and take on that responsibility themselves because they are concerned about what happens once that product gets back to Western markets. Um, but in terms of the Chinese government overseeing that regularly, I am not aware that that happens adequately. And one other question, and that is, do you have any data at all on, on any uh, tainted products or, or um, poultry that we have received from China that has caused uh, illness. I did look for that. I didn't find anything specific to China. Is this taking place now or this is proposed? Because it, it, in the handout it says will, not are. Um, I think I just missed Typed. I apologize. Um, no, this was approved, I want to say, if it, as, if it isn't currently happening, it's been approved to happen. The president has signed it, uh, the go-ahead. So this is something that, if it's not currently it, going on. It isn't on, a long-term po policy. It would be a new policy. It's a new policy, but it will be long-term, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I wondered if I could just add a little something to this because it's my understanding that as of um, the spring of last year, the U.S. changed the policy to expand the imports from China to include chicken that's been raised in China as well as chicken that was raised elsewhere and simply processed in China because they signed an agreement saying that Chinese processing or Chinese chicken raising was, quote, equivalent, which you mentioned in here that from equivalent countries it would. So that is something that I believe uh, is ongoing now. So I, it, I had that same question, mm -hmm. and what I looked at and the calls that I made to um, USDA, they said that is not currently happening, um, and that is a proposal but hasn't gone into effect. So I, I don't have good answers to that. Um, and if you, even on their website, it currently says that only cooked chicken is allowed to be imported. My understanding is this agreement was for cooked chicken, but grown in China. It, so like previously it was cooked chicken from the U.S. going mm -hmm. to China, and then it was expanded. It may well be that it isn't yet showing up in the supermarkets, which is, I think, what you're saying. 
Yes, that yes, that that is my understanding, and this is you know it. it Honestly, it's been very challenging. No one really wants to be forthcoming with information um, because they're, they're I, I think, quite nervous about how we're all going to react to it. Um, but I, I did not get a lot of good answers when I was asking these kind of questions. Okay. Representative Heckman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A, a, a comment first. The proposed rule that Sharon Treat is referring to had a comment section that closed on August the 15th of 2017. And that would be the eligibility of People's Republic of China to export to the United States poultry products from birds that are slaughtered in the People's Republic of China. And I believe that that deal was made because there are high tariffs on beef exports from this country, mm -hmm. and I believe that was the trade-off. So that if we could send beef to China, China should also be able to slaughter its own chickens, cook them, and send them back to us to expand this other opportunity. One of my questions goes back to the certificate of inspection that is required on poultry products that are processed in this country. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say certificate of inspection? To a certain degree, yes. I believe that there is a provision in the federal code that requires any poultry product that is turned into food for human consumption that is prepared has to have an inspector on site for the entire preparation and processing of that chicken product from start to finish. Yes, for USDA, yes. Would that same requirement be available to the chicken that is processed for human consumption in China? No. So what does that do, not just for food safety, but what does it possibly do to, again, the price point of chicken that can be produced without this certificate of inspection, this need to have an inspector there the entire time that chicken is processed? Because I've been told that that really harms even the mid-sized chicken producer here in the state of Maine. Absolutely. Which I'm hoping that our chicken farmer can talk about. <laughs> but it just seems to me that this is extremely unequal and it goes yes. in the opposite direction of food safety on a large scale. That is essentially what I found in everything that I spoke with. Uh, basically, uh, China has no incentive to supervise from egg to processed bird. Um, that he, there, and there is a good reason for them not to do that because the lower their costs of production are, the more countries are going to say, well, we'll just send our chicken to China. China. Why not? Um, so it, it's, um, I mean, I, I'm sure that the beef producers would disagree that this was a bad deal, um, but I, I, I don't believe this is um, beneficial for poultry consumers. And I don't believe that it will create anyone with the impetus to want to have a poultry processing facility anywhere in this country from setting one up. Um, just for the commission's uh, clarity, there was an article delayed July 7th, 2017, and it starts saying the first known shipment of cooked chicken from China reached the United States last week. So it would have been at in the, the beginning of last July that we were getting our first imports of chicken slaughtered here, sent there for processing, and returned to us as a food product. You're welcome. Did you contact our congressional delegation and see if they could get you more specific answers? Because it sounds like the USDA wasn't really forthcoming. I did um, contact Senator King's office. Um, and they were able to provide me some information. This is an issue that is of great concern to them. Um, but essentially they didn't have, uh, their answers that came from USDA were the same answers that I got, that it, USDA believes, based on the inspection that they conducted, that China is able to um, meet or exceed USDA standards for processing of chicken. 
Well, well, just a comment that I know that in the past when we've had trouble getting information, in, in this case it was from the U.S. Trade Representative, um, Senator King's office actually wrote a letter to the U.S. Trade Representative and said, please answer the, the letter that came from the, you know, Trade Commission and it actually uh, we did get a letter, not that it was necessarily really <coughs> responsive, but at least we got an answer. So, you know, when we get into a discussion phase here on some of these topics, we could talk about our doing letters and then maybe that we could get help from our members of Congress making sure that there's answers to those letters. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator. I would be interested in hearing from our farmer um, if she could just maybe tell us a little bit about her business, her farm, sure. her production, who she serves, and what she feels about any of the issues that we are talking about regarding Chinese chicken. My name is Gretchen Hutner. I live in Monson, which is in Piscataquis County, which would be Senator Davis's territory. Mm -hmm. um, and our family has a small diversified operation. We have raised three to 400 um, poultry birds at any one time during our peak. Um, and we're in the process of expanding. We supply our poultry to friends and neighbors. Our CSA customers buy it. Um, I'm hoping I don't give incriminating testimony here. Um, we are this year going to be getting a thousand bird permit from the Maine Department of Agriculture. Um, we've previously had birds done by a local um, family that we thought was inspected, but it came to light that they weren't doing what they thought they were doing. So last year we scaled back drastically until we could try to figure out what was going on. Um, and we had applied for an ag development grant that was not, excuse me, not funded. Um, so we're still in the process of figuring out how to deal with our pro poultry processing. Um, I have eight children. So for me, I can speak as a farmer and also as a parent, if that makes any difference. Um, most of the people that we sell to, I will say all of them, they are interested in a relationship with us. They want to be able to come to our farm. They want to be able to see the birds alive. Um, we post pictures on our Facebook page and we welcome visitors to come and, and we do several tours through the summer. Um, we don't advertise our poultry, it's all word of mouth. Um, I run up against people that will say to me, your poultry prices are too expensive. And I have to say to them, this is the cost of production. If I, and, and we do not make a large profit on this. Um, our birds last year were sold for three fifty a pound. And um, I saw maybe 25 to 50 cents a pound profit on that. Um, it's Probably hard. a gross profit at that. Pardon me? A gross profit at yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, we justify our birds because we raise our own poultry for our family's needs, the vast majority of it. But also, the birds work into our operation, um, filling a key nutrient requirement that we need as far as um, fertility in our ground and in our soil. So. We're aiming for an integrated, sustainable type of operation where the poultry, um, right now we're willing to not have a very good profit on the poultry because it's helping us in other ways. Um, so I think for us, a lot of people that we know raise 100 to 200 birds. Um, <coughs> You know, there are others that their goal is 600 birds. We're all small, a lot of us are small producers. Um, and um, I can't envision raising more than a thousand birds. I mean, that includes some turkeys as well. Um, so I just, it, it makes me nervous, the concept of the chicken possibly being available in Maine for a couple of reasons. One is that price point issue and that we already deal with people that will say, well, I'll go to Walmart and get my chicken. Um, and how, how do you refute that? You know, you have to, I have to say, well, you work within your budget and what do you um, psychologically feel is appropriate? Um, 
but there is a trend, and I've seen it over the last 10 to 20 years, where people are much more interested in where their food comes from in Maine, and just having that connection and, and feeling like it's safe. So. And it's really hard to compete with Walmart. You, you can't. Uh, on your level. I have to offer them something else. Compete in other ways. Now, yes. Are, are your chickens uh, range-fed chickens? Do you, do you market it that way? Um, so our operation has Mafka certified produce. Okay. So I have some rogue chickens that like to escape, which my inspector really doesn't like. Um, for the most part, we run them in chicken tractors or electrified poultry netting. Okay. Um, that's how we do it, and we feel pretty good about that. And do you raise an offer consumption, or do you have any layers? We have layers as well. We're running 60 to 70 layers right now. That helps on the profit side a little bit, perhaps? It does. I mean, we have a micro dairy, we have sheep, we have about 13 enterprises on our farm, which is a lot, but they tend to balance each other out and they give us a little bit of um, buffer in case any one enterprise has issues in a given year. Um, the produce is, is um, our, our hope is to have a balanced operation mm -hmm. where about a, half of our production is um, produce and half of it is livestock related. So one of your biggest issues right now is, is processing their birds. Processing is a huge issue. The only USDA processor, to my knowledge, in the state of Maine is Central Maine Poultry, and that is in Gardner. And so for us, I live in Monson. Um, from Monson to Gardner is roughly 100 miles. Um, I had looked into and made arrangements with them to tentatively do a batch of birds for us two years ago. Um, they wanted 300 birds at a time. That's almost my whole year's production. And we had thought in that year that we'd be able to do 600 birds and try to break them into two batches of 300. But we had some losses. And then trying to um, beg and borrow crates to be able to truck that many because they want them all crated. Um, and you're required to deliver them by 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, and you need to pick them up around noon. I think it's noon or 2 o'clock. At $5 a bird, that would mean our farm coming up with $1,500 in addition to all those production expenses and the travel. It, it, it is very difficult because it would take us a while to move 300 birds. So then we're getting into freezing and um, other avenues. And how many small producers would you say there are in the state of Maine? Do you have any idea? And what I'm, and what I'm getting at is, there, is there an opportunity maybe for a lot of these people to do some of their own processing? And yes, there are quite a few that that work under the thousand bird rule. And in doing so, you do need an inspector on site. Yep, um, the Department of oh, Ag. Well, no, it's not for the thousand bird rule in the state of Maine. The Department of Ag will come. They require a water test, mm -hmm. and they require to see where you're going to process the birds and how you're going to handle them. Okay. And depending on what you're going to do with the birds, because there's a difference between processing and selling whole birds and processing and selling a bird that's cut up, that would then require a commercial kitchen and additional inspections and, and such. Um, there's also a labeling issue. If we label, if we process up to a thousand birds that on our farm and um, we have the permit, then everything needs to be labeled with um, the farm of origin. So there is a labeling issue with that. And, you know, it's something three years ago we moved to a new farm. So trying to scale up mm -hmm. um, costs a lot of money. It does. So it's one of those things where you make a list and you check them off slowly. So for the 1,000 bird exemption, mm -hmm. you can only sell a whole bird? Unless you can then take it to a commercially inspected facility to cut it up. We have a situation on our farm where um, the new farm has a farmhouse that had two kitchens in it. So um, 
in talking, we have our meat license for beef and lamb and those, you know, a larger livestock, and we take it to Herring Brothers in Guilford, which is right down the road, um, which is a USDA inspector. So, um, where am I going with this? We have a kitchen that, in talking with the inspector, because he does both kitchens and the, the meat license, um, I think if I plumb in another sink to the extra kitchen that we have, that we will be able to pass as a commercial kitchen because we will have enough sinks and wash areas and we will have the adequate, you know, of what they're looking for. So that is our long term goal so that we can, because we also eventually would like to do some value added. Um, so that, yeah, does that answer your question? It does. And you talked about a single inspector. So are you saying now that there are inspectors trained to work with the farm side of the poultry business, meaning the slaughtering under the 1,000 bird exemption for whole bird sales? Mm -hmm. And also someone who also could inspect a commercial kitchen that would be able to cut that chicken up and package it and sell it for maybe yeah. a higher price per pound? Yeah. The, but is um, it the same inspector or two different ones? The Maine is a small state. Yeah. <laughs> so there are three Department of Ag inspectors that handle kitchens. I am not sure if they are also the ones that handle the thousand bird rule or not. Uh, that you would need to clarify with them. Um, I first learned about this at a farmer's market convention and Rhonda, Rhonda is all I can tell you, from um, Quality Assurance. She was the inspector um, who did a presentation and she was trying to encourage more farms to pursue the Thousand Bird mm -hmm. permit because it opens up our markets. Mm -hmm. It opens up our ability to um, allow that oversight so that we all feel good about what we're trying to do. Um, and I also know that Rhonda is one of the inspectors that handles the kitchen and that kind of um, inspection. But those inspectors also do honeybees and you know they, they do a lot of different enterprises. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. And so here at a small scale, a operator needs to have a lot of oversight in order to even sell one whole bird for $3.50 a pound, and we're discussing another country without any real oversight. It says two FDA inspectors inspecting 500,000 plants processing poultry in China is gonna, I don't know what the hit is gonna be, but I'm gonna say it's a lot of misses where you have this chicken coming back into our country processed for human consumption, the USDA says it's equal to or it's adequate enough. And this is flooding our shelves and it's driving the price of poultry down while our own poultry farmers are struggling to make ends meet. Would that be an appropriate summary of what we're going here? I think that would be pretty close. I mean, as far as the oversight, I feel like the oversight on our part that we would be policed more by our consumers yep. than by the government. Absolutely. But I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing to be policed by our own peers and yeah. in our market. Um, and I, you know, I, it's nice to see that support system in our market that wants us to do that, that wants, you know, that they want to have that knowledge of um, the source and they want to be able to see that and do their own inspection in their own yeah. mind. If we could do anything we had the power to do, if we had the power to do anything we wanted, what, what, what should we do, if anything, about what we're talking about here? I have an answer. As a parent, um, you know, we try to buy as local as we can, but I'm guilty of buying, you know, processed things from other places. <coughs> um, but we always look at where it comes from. We always look at the plant. You know, I have my kids trained that 
you can look at a Hannaford milk bottle and figure out where the, where the milk is coming from. Um, so having some kind of having some kind of point of origin for me as a as a farmer or and as a parent, it means that consumers can make an informed decision of where their food is coming from, whether it's it's local or whether it's far away and how far away it is. If I could make one suggestion, and I think the commission has far more weight than I ever will. Um, when you look at the requirements for a small processor to be able to sell only within the state of Maine, and then you look at what is allowable to be sent to the United States from a foreign country, why are we making it so difficult for our own people to produce poultry or anything else? I mean, why are the constraints so difficult for our own farmers as compared to what's being imported into our country? In other words, we're overregulated, in your opinion, relative to what they are. Yes, I would say maybe not overregulated, but there should be an, at least an equal regulation. And I, I don't know if you can go anywhere with it, but there should be a requirement that I don't care if the bird grows <coughs> up here. If it is processed outside of this country, I should be able to know that as a consumer. Well, you would like a country of production and country of <laughs> processing. Market. I mean, that's, that's me. Uh, there are countries that we avoid certain foods from because we know that there are issues. That, that's my house. My teenagers flip packages over all the time. That is the mindset that we have. And um, if we don't know, we tend not to buy it. In your uh, written uh, write-up, which is great, it says that there's two FDA inspectors that oversee the 500,000 food production and processing companies in China. Can you give us an idea of what that ratio is in the United States? I believe there are a total of 30,000 production sites in the United States, um, and there's a whole lot more than two. And in terms of, um, you were saying, in-state regulation versus international regulation of what can be brought in to what what are what are some of the major differences what is what is lo more scrutinized in state versus what can be brought in other than the number of inspectors or inspections meat to be distributed in the state of Maine it can be done in a custom processing situation mm -hmm which the thousand bird rule, which I'm noticing Julie has the, the rules and stuff right here, um, that can, you know, the, the farm being permitted is considered a custom operation. If I, that means that any of my meat done at a custom place needs to stay within the state of Maine. For me to try to ship any of my meats, whether it would be poultry or large animals, red meats, um, it would have to go through, um, for it to cross state lines, it would have to be done at a USDA inspected facility where there would be an inspector on hand all the time. So Central Maine Meats, they have a USDA inspector there for their poultry and it gets the USDA label and then it can travel across state lines. The nerve wracking thing as a producer and as a parent would be the international foods you don't know because there isn't any type of inspection label certifying that anyone knows what's going on. Um, so I don't know if that helps or if that was appropriate. But. Yes, Senator Marymount. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the case of that USDA inspector, is a, a designee of the uh, company that's doing the processing by the USDA or is it an actual employee of the USDA? You would have to check with the Department of Ag, but I believe that it's a USDA employee. Yes. Yes, it, it is. Yeah. It, yeah. They actually have to pay the USDA right, the company to sit, to sit there. They have to give them a shower room. There's like a, an enormous expense to 
um, the processing facilities to have someone on site all the time that, yeah, is not their employee, it's a USDA employee. Quite a capital expense, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> in regards to your customers that are, are buying your products mm -hmm. because it is a high quality product uh, for the most part, um, are they willing to pay that extra price? Uh, are you finding it difficult to get? I have some that um, pay it without a blinking an eye. Right. Um, I also have some, because I live in rural Piscataquis County, um, I have some that buy it, um, and I know for them it's a stretch financially, mm -hmm. but they're very honest. They would rather buy a little bit of a very good thing mm -hmm. than a lot of something that was less. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I feel guilty charging those people, but um, one, one thing that we decided several years ago when we looked at our books was that for a long time as we were building up our farm, we subsidized area residents' food bills and at the detriment of my own family. And that's a hard thing to stomach when you know that you're doing that. So we've had, you know, thankfully we've been involved with Mofka and they've been helping us figure out cost of production so that we can strike our prices better and feel good that we're not losing money and subsidizing the general, you know, market that we supply to um, and get where we're, we're going. Country of origin labeling used to be required for raw meats. And that was repealed in an omnibus budget in 2015. There's never actually been a requirement for processed meats to have any type of country mm. of origin labeling attached to them. And so it would seem to me that it would be a very uphill a recommendation to make. But I do feel as though the consumer has a right to know. And I don't know if this commission will want to take any action to advise our delegation to push for a renewal of the country of origin labeling for both raw and processed meats. But I suppose we can talk about that. Um, I just, I, 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 the market pressures are going to be what they are. This is a deal that is in effect. These provisional rules are out for even allowing meat that is raised and slaughtered in China to become a part of our meat supply here. And given that in the state of Maine, we import 90% of all the food we consume from elsewhere, I would imagine, without seeing the numbers in front of me, that what we import for poultry is probably even higher than that, given that there are very few poultry processors in Maine anymore. I think, oh, four years ago, I think the number was like 96% of the poultry we consume comes from somewhere else. And so if the possibility that that is all coming from China that's, that's devastating for human health, environmental health, but also for the economy um, of, of Maine people um, and Maine farmers in particular. So I hope this commission makes some statement and takes some action on this very alarming situation we find ourselves in. Okay. If there are no other questions from the commission, I guess we can excuse you temporarily and we'll get locked back up hey, here. <clears throat> And uh, I would like to see a, a motion here for some sort of a letter to the feds, or I'll let you uh, make some suggestions. Well, um, as it's been discussed, uh, in the past, I've been doing, I've been staffing the CTPC since, uh, I believe, 2010. And during my tenure as staff, I think that the commission in a number of instances, as referred to by Sharon, um, has decided to author letters, um, mostly towards the USTR, directed towards the U United States Trade Representative, um, sometimes with CC to members of Maine's congressional delegation. At other times, you've chosen to write directly to members of Maine's congressional delegation. And there's nothing that would say that you couldn't do both at the same time. 
as you know, um, the commission has no real authority um, aside from taking action to try to pressure or suggest a different course of action through letter writing, formal motions of the commission, that kind of thing. Um, have I answered your question? You have. Okay. I guess uh, I'll open up to the commission for some suggestions or Well, just, if I could just give an update on the country of origin labeling issue. Um, the um, Representative Hickman is absolutely right. The Congress did repeal the country of origin labeling requirements um, for um, pork and poultry, I think it was. Beef, pork, and Beef, pork, and yeah. And um, actually as part of the, you know, as we're going to talk about, have been talking about, NAFTA is being renegotiated. And there are quite a few um, farm groups not the really huge meat packing companies, but the smaller, um, some smaller farmers and organizations like the one I work for, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, that actually wrote to and testified to the U.S. Trade Representative to ask them to put, um, you know, to allow again country of origin labeling in NAFTA and to try to address any concerns that were raised by the um, World <coughs> Trade Organization. That was, uh, we, there was a bad decision. Canada and Mexico challenged the rule that the U.S. had and it, it did get into um, where meat was uh, raised, processed, and, and then, you know, sold. So uh, it, it did get into that whole circle of, issues there. Um, as far as I know, the U.S. Trade Representative has uh, not sought to do anything um, towards having that kind of country of origin labeling in NAFTA, but the negotiations are ongoing. As I'm going to say in two minutes, again, nothing is really resolved yet. So it would be perfectly timely, and I happen to know that the European Union has um, country of origin labeling for meat that is very similar to or even more extensive than what was repealed by the U.S. Congress. And even China is requiring country of origin labeling for things going to China. So there's an extremely strong argument in favor of revisiting this issue in the U.S. And we could probably come up with some backup information for a letter that would point out some of these um, you know, facts <laughs> so about what other countries are getting the benefit of it, but we are not. And I think also the reference to the testimony we had today about how this is so directly linked to our own smaller farmers who, who's, who really, whose marketing is aimed towards people within the state knowing that um, they're purchasing local meats and also being able to distinguish those local meats from something else that's coming in from out of the state that isn't labeled, uh, which they can't really do right now. So if I'm hearing you, uh, a couple of letters strongly suggesting um, another look at the labeling issue and reconsideration would be probably in order. Representative Guerin. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Locke, I was wondering if if you could look up and find the dates and treaty language for the trade agreement that allows birds to be processed in China without labeling. And I, I certainly agree with very strongly worded letter to our delegation and to President Trump with our concerns about it. I had put it on Facebook last time we had a, a meeting about it. And I got more comments on that than anything I'd ever posted. They, wow. they were just, and there was no one who thought it was a good idea. They, capital letters, no, 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 <laughs> do not allow this. And, and I, I think sometimes I feel some frustration with being on this commission, but maybe we can take this and make it an issue that we are going to take a stand on and, and until something's done. You know, maybe do a press release from the commission and say, contact your congressional de delegation we want something done about this because I think our citizens do not want this food. We need to light a little fire, maybe. Anything over here? Yes. I think one other thing we may consider doing just to 
circle the wagons, as it were, is to draft a very strong joint resolution or to, we don't really draft the joint resolution, but we could recommend that our presiding officers sign off on a joint resolution, um, putting some data together and making a strong claim that we require some action at the federal government and joint resolutions get sent um, to Congress and the, to the appropriate agency if we direct it. And so I would. Um, Could I? Yes, sir. Add to that. Um, and can back me up on this, but there's precedent for the commission doing that. Um, you have, this commission has sponsored resolutions that have gone through the legislature in the past. So is there a motion anywhere? Senator, we draft letters to the... Your mic. Thank you. I move that we draft letters to the trade representative and to our congressional delegation uh, calling for country of origin labeling, asking that that be revisited or pressure applied, and that we also request a joint resolution with the language as you were just discussing it, and Locke was listening to, so we'll, we'll have to follow up on that to really fill it in, but we can with the information that's necessary to make the points that we're trying to make. That's your motion. We have a second. Could I ask just a clarifying question? So, Senator, you're recommending letters to the USTR and to members of the congressional delegation, as well as drafting a resolution to be presented to the legislature. Do that's I have that correct. right? Yes. Okay. And uh, if I may, Mr. Chair. Certainly. The, one of the things about a resolution, I would like that the commission publicize it widely because we learn about this, or maybe you already do, so I'm new to the committee, but they really don't know out in the community many times. A few people are paying attention. Those of us who belong to the CSAs or current farm uh, in a clean way, those are good. But I've seen, nobody believes me when I talk about going to India in various places, and everybody wears white. How do you keep white clean white. in India? <laughs> the, in major population areas, they have large concrete vats. They build four-foot block walls of concrete vats, and they fill them with chlor chlorine bleach. And then good their equipment is available to us, but their labor is cheap yeah. and plentiful. So people stand in these vats of chlorine bleach with a paddle, keep cleaning these clothes, and then they hang them out and they rinse them. And all around the side walls, there are people with no arms and legs, because when you stand around in chlorine bleach for years, they disintegrate. But that's what they do, and then the people who can still work, give them a little food, give them some pennies. When you know the things that are going on at the source of some of these, such as China has industrialized areas that are specialized and localized. And if it's an area that produces artificial leather, then they use all these chemicals and they dump them around the facility. So these people are dying of cancer in these areas for these. So to trust that these food producers in a place like China are doing anything without inspection, and then it's coming into our local stores, and people don't know about it in this state, it just really bothers me. So it's a, we'll do all we can, which is not a lot of power. The biggest thing we can do is make sure everybody's aware of these practices so that they can stand with us to try to make change. Sorry for the long speech. No, oh, that's very good. So also you mentioned a press release. I think that would be very important to get to the public. I have, uh, the if I could, I have two other suggestions. I'm sorry, please. I wondered if the good senator would be willing to amend his um, suggest his motion to include President Trump in the letter. Absolutely. Thank you. Mine was aligned. Those lines as well. Sorry. <laughs> You're on. Okay. Um, I also thought at least a copy of the letter should go to the to Sonny Perdue, um, Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. Because 
one of the things that's going on here, it's not like NAFTA has been this big production. We're hearing about it all the time. It's these all these rounds. But this China agreement was just negotiated sort of as an ongoing thing between the Department of Agriculture and China. So, you know, there wasn't, I mean, there are those proposed regulations, but they may have actually, you know, gone into effect as an emergency kind of yeah, thing. You never yeah, know. yeah, <laughs> there's been a lot of that. So, so anyway, um, I think getting to the Department of Agriculture as well is really important. I absolutely believe that's true. I think every member of the current legislature on this committee voted <clears throat> for that amended version of our food sovereignty around making sure that the regulations that the state has for meat and poultry would be honored here in Maine. And that came from Secretary Purdue. So I would suggest heavily that we include him in our correspondence because it's just a little ironic. I will also say that I'll look up this information and maybe distribute it to the commission when I have it, but there was a documentary that I saw five or six years ago already that talked about, and Senator Miramont's discussion of what's going on in India reminded me of this, that in China, in poultry processing facilities, six, five or six years ago, people, waifs, po people impoverished would be bringing in chickens that they collected on the side of the road into these processing facilities and those processing facilities would take the chicken in and put them in the food products that were then being distributed um, as fit for human consumption to consumers all over the world and I will absolutely get the name of that documentary but if this is what we now will have flooding our markets it's just a travesty of human health and I think we should make a very strong statement to try to stop it. I think so do we have someone else that wants did you have a question no okay. so I could I just one second okay and then I'll, I'll let you do that um, so we do have a motion which is letters to the appropriate people uh, and then a resolution now, is this all going to be part of the same motion a resolution to the legislature which will get the legislature's attention and then I think a press release. Do you want to include that in your motion, Senator, as well? All three things? It needs to be in it. Yes. Yeah. The press release. Yes, I, yeah. I think the press yeah. release is important and that we all try to get that publicized. Right. Along with the other two, as mentioned, I'm open to this being, including anybody who you think is important and should be included. And those both sounded very good, like good ideas. And locking your I, I thought I should mention that you, I thought of two other sort of tools that you have at your disposal. One, the commission is required by law to have two different public hearings each calendar year in two locations, different locations across the state. You have a very wide latitude about what you want those hearings to be about. It's totally up to you. So one suggestion is that you could have a separate hearing just on this issue mm -hmm. if you wanted to publicize it even further, supplemented by the press release. The second thought is something that I'm going to be discussing with you in a lot more detail later in this meeting, hopefully, is that the, um, the commission is required to do a biannual assessment. And you have a pretty wide latitude, as with hearings, to determine the topic of the assessment. You may choose, I'm just suggesting, to consider making the assessment focus on this mm -hmm. issue. You could do that. Good suggestion. Okay. And we have Those a chairs meeting. I'm sure we'll be able to put something yeah, together. Sure. Okay. Um, so, let, yeah, let's, uh, let's get this one past us. Is there any more discussion or any? Uh, I, I just right had one ahead. more um, suggestion. It, it really isn't part of the motion. But when we do the press release, perhaps we should have a press conference. I think that gets a lot more attention if there's people standing behind it. Mm -hmm. so. so let's let's take a, a vote by a show of hands. All those that are in favor of this motion. It looks to be unanimous. Locke, um, I would like to suggest that you do a draft and then get it out to us so that we can 
perhaps come back with any suggestions or standard operating procedure for me. Right. And, and any input that can come from the Farm Bureau or anyone else who has worked on this issue and looked into it already for the purposes of both the letter and the joint resolution to the full legislature would be welcome. And we can certainly talk about that offline. Okay. I guess. Um, 